Hey everybody, happy end of 2016. Uh, this video is going to cover my top 10 favorite games from 2016, as well as some other things. Uh, first, I'm gonna do three things. We're gonna do the top 10 games, then we're gonna do a list of 20 games that I considered for the top 10. A uh, little spoiler, I think this is maybe my favorite year of gaming. And then after those 20 games, which I will go through real briefly, I promise you, uh, I will get to basically four contests that I'm running. And I'll have more details there at the end, but I'm gonna be giving away four different games. And they're all from different sort of prongs and, and era areas. So let's just jump into the top 10, my favorite top 10 games of 2016. And number 10 is Fabled Fruit. Now this is a recent release here from Stronghold Games, designer Friedman Freeze, who did Power Grid and everything. I've done reviews of all these, so definitely go check out the reviews on my channel and others' channels as well. This is kind of like a legacy style card game very simple trading and set collecting, real simple mechanics, but you kind of evolve through this massive deck of uh, different special abilities and different cards that you can buy. I think we've played, I can't, I've, I mean, honestly, I lost track, but we're a little bit over halfway through uh, the main deck. We've been playing this at lunch at work uh, most days, and we are having a blast with it. It's very, very fun, especially as you get through kind of the first few cards and things start to get more interesting, more subtle, a lot more fun. So definitely check this one out. This is one that I think could fit in any group, uh, any group where you have like that 20 to 30 minute type of range that you can play it in. We usually play it about twice uh, during lunch hour if we have the time. Uh, really excellent, lots of fun. Uh, my friend Sean keeps winning. <laughs> So that's my only knock against it. Maybe I would rank it higher if some of us would win once in a while. But he seems to be really good at this. So we do win sometimes. So that's number 10, Fabled Fruit. Uh, number nine is Escape Room for the game. Now this is one that I've played with the family. We have loved this one to death. Uh, it's got four different escape rooms in it. Uh, you can only really play through them once. There's not really a chance to want to play uh, through them. I think it retails for 40 bucks, so that's like $10 per room, which is going to cost you a lot more if you were to do an actual escape room. Uh, I definitely think this is the best of kind of the escape room genre board game that has started to proliferate. Uh, go watch my review of it, but this one really kind of grounds you in a place and a time and a theme, and the clues are not just cerebral, they're very visual. And then, you know, there's like little maps of rooms and things that you can sort of uh, start to, to digest and deduce and deduct everything out of uh, the room. And you can even get like a little uh, soundtrack and download it. I know this, I think there's at least two expansions. They might be out. I don't know if they're out yet, but they will be out at some point. Uh, so you can have a lot of bang for your buck out of this. And really the system that they use here is it's got this machine that you put, throw some batteries in and it sort of tells you if you solve the clue or got the clue wrong or it'll give you little uh, you know audio hints to go and grab a hint card and put it in this little decoder to kind of move you along and it feels the most like an actual escape room out of any of the board games that i've played you definitely got to check this one out so that's number nine escape room the game uh, number eight is 13 days and this is from ultra pro slash jolly roger uh, this one is very simply is kind of like Twilight Struggle in 30 to 45 minutes. There's been a few games over the last few years that try to do that. They try to get that kind of card play, uh, you know, sort of bluffing and, you know, head to head type of thing with some kind of political overtones or some historical overtones. This is the one really that's, that knocks it out of the park. Uh, it really fits the theme very well. There's a lot of tension. There's a lot of kind of, um, tug of war in a way, but in a really kind of, uh, you know, developed and complex way without being a complex game to play, but in terms of like figuring out where the strategy is, what kind of influence you're trying to pull left or right uh, in terms of uh, the Soviet Union and the United States kind of manipulating uh, the situation they're trying to. Uh, this is an excellent, excellent game. And it's easy enough to play that I think you don't have to be like, oh, it's a big, you know, historical game. It's going to be really overwhelming and everything. This isn't really like that at all. Uh, but I think it's this is going to be one of those that you can hit like people at, at lots of different levels. And it's really interesting. It's got nice little story flavor and stuff, or excuse me, history flavor and all that kind of stuff in here. So that's uh, number eight, 13 days. <laughs> the next game is probably the polar opposite in size to this box. So give me a minute while I lift this up. This is Mechs versus Minions, and this is number seven. I'm gonna see if I can hold it here while I talk the whole time. I probably just bumped my mic, but sorry for that. Uh, so this one has got a lot of uh, hype, a lot of hoopla, 
well-deserved. Uh, we haven't played through all of the missions yet. I think I'm through six now, maybe seven if you include the tutorial. Uh, the really fun game, really just excellently designed, uh, put together. The production is amazing. Everybody's talked about that. The game itself is really, really, really fun. Uh, definitely my favorite in terms of just like the programming aspect and how you program your mechs to march around. Uh, definitely go pick up some reviews on this one. And I know Rodney at Watch It Played, I think he's done like an exhaustive how-to and he's played through all the scenarios. You don't really have to worry about spoilers. I know some people get kind of hung up on the spoilers in this. There's nothing really to spoil. It's just, you know, you kind of unlock stuff as you go through similar to a legacy game but there's nothing this one there's nothing stopping you from playing through all 10 scenarios again and again and again as you get better at it so this is just it's been a hit across the board with folks that i've played it with if you really like cooperative games uh it's it's a really different kind of thing it's a little bit of real time but not on, not too much uh, but there's not really much more i could say about this that hasn't been said uh, it's an excellent production i hope riot does you know try their hand at some other types of games too because uh you know maybe it'll be three years before we see another game from them but that's okay because it, it, hopefully it'll be just as good so that's number seven mechs versus minions and number six is dead zone second edition now dead zone had come out a few years ago maybe two three years ago and they've kind of revamped and redesigned their formula as mantic is want to do <laughs> uh, but this is uh, an all-encompassing package. If you get this, you've got a really sort of uh, streamlined Necromunda, Mordheim, Frostgrave, sci-fi style campaign game. So you're going to be playing head-to-head. -head. You've got to put together the miniatures. You can paint them. You should paint them. And you know, you're gonna, you've got terrain that you can build out. You can buy extra terrain. You can get extra armies. It's very, very, very affordable. So if you think of this style of game, a lot of times it's not super affordable. Uh, now, the minis in here are not like Games Workshop quality minis, and there's a reason Games Workshop minis are more expensive, but they're good. I mean, they're good enough. And you know, I've, I've painted a few of these already and, and played with them. The game, though, you can really get in. You can buy like an extra army. It costs like 40 bucks, and you get a whole bunch of miniatures, and you can get like a rat army in space or a rebel army or dwarven armies, and it's all this kind of sci-fi stuff. It's a really good well-designed system. Uh, the combat and everything and the movement is very, very streamlined and accessible and fun and strategic. And so it doesn't have a lot of some of the, you know, kind of baggage that some miniatures games have where you're like rolling 500 billion dice and all this stuff like that. So I highly recommend this. This is a, a an interesting kind of time. I think we're seeing a lot of this kind of system now, uh, these kind of skirmish level where you can kind of get into the role playing aspects, get into the campaign aspects of it. Uh, this one is just a great out of the box, uh, you know, type of thing uh, to get. So I would definitely recommend this if you have even kind of the inkling to, you know, you like minis at all or anything. So that's number six. That was Dead Zone Second Edition. And number five is Innis. This is coming over from Asmodee, uh, published by Matagot. Uh, this is right up my alley. This hits me on all the different cylinders. It's got card drafting. It's got area control. It's got very subtle and interesting card play. It's got crazy wild cards that will throw the balance off of the game, but it's also something that you have to kind of tack against and balance yourself uh, in terms of the gameplay and how you draft. And maybe you draft preventative cards because some cards will counter other cards or, you know, be more, uh, you know, attacking or, or, or sort of, you know, wall people off. And so they can't make the most out of their uh, cards that they have. Uh, the artwork in here is amazing. I think I, I love the artwork in here, top to bottom, the cover, the art in the cards. I, I even like the art on the tiles. I know that's probably the sticker, but I think it works good. It's a very interesting design in terms of the graphic design and very interesting design actually in terms of the game's mechanics. Um, it's just going to play very, very differently each time that you play. And there's really going to be a, a solid, you know, meaty, deep meta game that you can really explore uh, in this for a long time to come. Uh, so definitely take a look at this. Look at some reviews on this one too, if you haven't heard of it or anything. Uh, that's Innis there, and that was number number five. Number four, this one came out of nowhere for me. Uh, this is Santorini. Uh, so the publisher emailed me and said, hey, we got this game Santorini, do, would you like to look at it? And I, I, I was Roxley Games, and I think I reviewed, um, it was a deck building game where you like mine the earth. 
uh, Motherload, which was a very, very interesting deck builder. And I was like, okay, these guys have done good stuff. I looked at it and I was like, holy cow, the components are awesome. And so I said, okay, sure. Now, little side note, uh, Santorini is the name of a restaurant that me and my wife like to visit. It's probably our favorite restaurant. There's an Indian place that maybe <laughs> gives it a run for its money, but uh, so we go there a lot and we have sort of this fantasy that we will retire on the island of Santorini one day. And so I was like, well, I bet my wife will play this with me because of the name. And she did. And we both love it. Um, it might be my favorite abstract game that I've ever played. It's a very, very simple abstract game in its core mechanics. You kind of move these little figures around, which are like children of gods, and you kind of rebuild the city of Santorini, which effectively gets destroyed at the end of each game, at least in the story that it gives you. And But you have this giant stack of special ability cards, and you can just like randomly deal each one to each player, lay, t lay a couple out, draft them, whatever. And each of it has just one special ability to change up that very, very simple core gameplay. And again, kind of dovetailing off of Innis, it has that sort of metagame where you can say, okay, you've got this ability that lets you move faster, or this one allows you to build quicker, or do some other kind of weird building, break the rule kind of thing. And so maybe we'll play it, and then this happens, my wife will kick my butt in five minutes, and I'm like, oh, I see how that works. <laughs> then we'll play again with the same abilities, and then it'll be a much more interesting, you know, game. Well, the first game was still interesting, but it has that kind of abusable thing that you can really kind of bang on these powers and get a lot of cool stuff out of it. And the components, like I said earlier, are fantastic and amazing components. So definitely uh, take a look at this one. I haven't played it with more than two. Uh, it's supposed to play with three and four, but uh, I mean, this is an awesome two-player game. One of the best. Uh, that was Santorini. That was number four. Now number three here is Warhammer Quest Silver Tower, which probably comes as no surprise to anybody that watched my top solo games video because this is my number one solo game right now, I guess, of all time. This is a really uh, different kind of dungeon crawl. It's a co-op dungeon crawl, which, of course, you can play solo. And it's a very... Uh, Interesting system. It kind of reminds me of Claustrophobia in terms of the dice activation. You have some dice that you roll and you can activate them for special abilities. And you have kind of a universal uh, dice pool that you can pull from. And then you kind of have to like reset it after you pull and remove a die and so on. Uh, and then it goes through just kind of like a traditional dungeon crawl where you hack and slash. And then there's like a, a Tales of the Arabian Night storybook uh, style storybook where you have these little encounters and things that will drive it and just little paragraphs that you'll read. Uh, the cool thing for me that's kind of sold it for me is getting some of the extra models that you can get because you can pull from their uh, Warhammer universe, the Age of Sigmar universe and uh, and throw them out. So there's like 30 different characters you can just go buy. And it's really cool because you can just, you know, buy one or two dwarves or whatever and send it with, you know, the dwarf that comes with it. So you have like a dwarven raiding party. Or you can have a bunch of zinch uh, sorcerers that want to take revenge on the zinch uh, summoner that, you know, runs this tower. Or you can have some corn bloodbound maniacs go in here and just try to raid it because they're insane or whatever. So you can really kind of get into the RPG side of it. And uh, the characters are all out of whack and out of bounds. <laughs> like some characters are really powerful. So, but the cool thing about that is you can take like a Knight Venator, which is one, or a Lord of Plagues, which have really strong abilities and try to solo it with them or try to do just, just two guys, you know? So you really, it kind of lets you say, hey, you know what, you balance this. And that's, you know, not necessarily the greatest design idea in the world, but it, for me, it really works, especially as a solo type of thing where you can really say, okay, I'm going to take this. I'm going to hurt myself. I'm not going to take any healers, that kind of stuff. So you can really just kind of go from it from a thematic perspective. And the mechanics are really, really solid though, on top of all of that. Uh, so definitely take a look at that. Just don't try to play a full Stormcast group because they will just wreck the dungeon. Um, so number two is the Star Wars Rebellion probably comes at no surprise. I had this very, very high on my list uh, earlier in the year. This is fantastic. This is like they say, Star Wars in a box. Uh, you got one side Rebel, one side Empire, and they're going back and forth. It's got a lot of interesting kind of just mechanics that are in there. So you've got this sort of bluffing mechanics where you're like putting out these missions and you're sending out leaders to activate different groups of units and move around. And you know, the more the Rogue One movie came out, I'm not going to spoil anything, but in terms of 
Oh, wow. I'm not sure how much I should say, because, you know, sometimes you can spoil on accident. Well, I'll just say some stuff in terms of the tone of that movie, in terms of like the purpose behind some of the uh, the characters and the protagonists, they kind of fit with how this game plays. And I think uh, that movie, which I really enjoy, and this really kind of get at the heart of the Star Wars universe beyond just like Jedi, Sith, you know, blah, 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 father, son, good, evil type stuff. It gets into sort of rebellion and empire and, uh, you know, totalitarianism and sort of the propaganda of one thing, you know. So I think if you're a Star Wars fan, you kind of get what I'm saying. I'm trying to talk around it without spoiling a movie, but um, this is cool. This is really, really cool. Um, the combat's very quick and simple. The, you know, the combat gets a lot of knock, but I don't get that. But uh, it's got just a lot of meat into it. It's going to take you about three, four hours in there. The best way to play it, actually, for me, is playing it uh, two on two. So you'll have like an admiral, which is like the space guy, and a general, which is like the ground troops on each side. And you have, they kind of just twist the way that the turn order works a little bit, but it makes for very kind of, just that little small wrinkle makes for an interesting kind of tactical uh, element there. And I would say, if you even if you're playing it two player, I would still play it like that so that you have to do the admiral and the general in a certain order because it does add a kind of a nice element. Um, uh, there's just a lot of meat in this box. Um, and there's just a lot to really chew on here. And this is one I think that uh, should get play uh, for years to come. Very, very excellent design all across the board. That was number two. So number one is ta -da, Great Western Trail. Uh, this is a game uh, it reminds me most of my favorite game of all time, and that's Kalis. Uh, this has a very interesting sort of dynamic to it in terms of kind of the Euro side of it, the strategic kind of nasty, toothy, uh, you know, aspect where you can sort of build these um, in different buildings that sort of act as a toll for people as they're trying to travel through the countryside and deliver their cattle for more and more money. And they kind of develop their engine that way. So they've got that aspect. You've got a very interesting kind of uh, race and pacing aspect, which is very similar to Kalos, because if you played a lot of Kalos, you know that you can race and sort of build the castle quickly or build the castle very slowly. And this has a similar kind of thing where you can kind of start to rush through the trail as the game evolves. You can start to speed through it if you wish, or you can kind of daisy chain it and slowly build up and get to the, you know, be very mitigating in terms of the cattle deck that you have and all that kind of stuff. And it has that also the visual aspect of it where you kind of develop the trail. Uh, and there's not a lot of buildings on the trail. There's a couple of neutral outposts at first and then players sometimes will start filling up the board with buildings and their types of buildings and certain types of buildings. There's so many different kinds of buildings in here. I think there's what, there's 10 and then they're double sided and you can mix up the order of the neutral buildings, which really changes the game up and is a lot of fun to do. And it's got this, that little bit of deck building, but it's not really deck building. It's like, it's like a hand management, but you can only see part of your hand at a time. Uh, Cause you're going to be spending through that and, and using your hand of cattle to, you know, take special actions or make a little bit extra money on your way and stuff. Uh, really there's a lot to this game and it just has that, that level of somewhat passive aggressive interaction, but it's really direct interaction after you've played a couple times. You, you know, somebody's out there, they just hurt you because of what they built or, or how fast they're moving or whatever, or they bought some cattle or whatever like that. So, and it's got the high level strategy, lots of different ways to kind of score points and pass the victory. And there's different ways you can go. And again, that kind of visual cue in terms of the theme and, and what you can do and all that. Uh, so this is an excellent game. So that is the top 10. And I know I've typically done, except for a couple years ago, I've done like groups, you know, Meritrash, Euro, stuff like that. And this year I kind of really thought about it and there's so many kind of like hybrids that are happening. And, and my, you know, my, my gaming sort of tendencies have sort of been uh, shifted a little bit this year because I've been getting more into kind of miniatures games and stuff like that. Uh, so these to me seem were the, the top 10 solid games, but I'm just gonna, I'm gonna blow through a list here of 20 and just give you, these were things that I considered putting in to the top 10. Now my top, I uh, will say the top five or six were pretty rock solid. And then the seven, eight, nine, 10, some of those you could probably swap in and out here and maybe you can shuffle up the top of the list a little bit too. Like, you know, Star Wars Rebellion and Great Western Trail, you know, but you got to kind of put it in an order. And, but after you kind of get after 10, it gets kind of murky. But these are all things that I think like, okay, yes, you, 
if you bought all the games that I mentioned, the 10 and then the 20 now, and that's it, that was your whole collection, you would be set. <laughs> so let's just jump through these and I'll give you kind of the thumbs up two sentence thing. Uh, Death Watch Overkill from Games Workshop, just reviewed that. Very kind of uh, unassuming, easy, quick, uh, miniatures combat game. Really, really good. Very, very subtle and interesting. Definitely get that. Following up that with uh, Gore Chosen, another Games Workshop game. I've kind of grouped these by categories. Uh, crazy gladiatory combat. Really reminds me a lot of last year's Star Wars Risk in terms of the card play and kind of the quickness and the deadliness of the game. Uh, really got to play that with four characters or four opponents at least. Uh, Terraforming Mars. Very close to making this list. Excellent kind of race for the galaxy style uh, board game where you're, going, you're terraforming Mars and playing different cards with tons of special effects. There's a huge deck of all these individual cards. Uh, Ponzi Scheme is a weird ec economic game. It has that level of brutality that I like in your sort of kind of auction-y style game. This is one you got to give it a couple of plays because it's going to kind of blow up in your face, in, a, in, in my opinion, a fun way. But then after you play with a group maybe that has played it a few times, <laughs> I would say you got to have that, that similar group because everybody can kind of watch each other. This going to really kind of, uh, kind of unlock those extra layers of depth. The next one, another Taste of Mitchell game is Oracle of Delphi. This is a Stefan Feld game. Uh, I think Feld fans are really going to love this game. It's, it's a very Feldy game, but it's a very different kind of way of scoring. It's kind of a pick up and deliver. Not really. It's kind of a race game. Not really. It has a very Feldian kind of dice mechanic. Uh, that's really cool. And the, and the board and everything looks really, really pretty. Uh, and the next one is Secret Hitler. This is sort of like your One Night Ultimate Werewolf or the Resistance. To me, this one fires the Resistance. It kills the Resistance off. It doesn't quite kill off One Night Ultimate Werewolf, uh, but we've actually had a ton of fun in this game. I think this is another one of those. Got to play it a couple of times. It's just a little bit more subtle than I think it first appears. Uh, very cool. And, you know, the theme might put people off because it's like Hitler and fascism, and that's awful. Um, but... It, the terms of like the politics of it, that because it's a politically themed thing, I think that kind of draws me into it a little bit in terms of like, oh, you're a fascist, but you're not a fascist. And like everybody's calling each other fascist and everybody's fascist. <laughs> All right. And then number whatever, whatever. Next one is Aeon's End. Uh, excellent, excellent, excellent deck building, cooperative deck builder. This really sits apart from a lot of the deck building games because it's uh, really ground in a time and a place, very bleak sort of setting and atmosphere, which is very cool. Uh, and the mechanics of like all the different heroes and the bosses and everything are very well developed, I think, and interestingly done. Definitely take a look at that. Uh, next one is The Arrival. This is a Martin Wallace game. Uh, it's published, uh, first time publisher put this out. And this is a very weird game uh, that I love, but it's been very, very mixed. It has a different kind of end game. It has a little bit of uh, coopetition type of thing happening. So you have sort of, you're kind of cooperating, you're sort of on a loose team in a way, but then you're kind of coming back together and then trying to stab each other in the back. So it's a very, very, uh, definitely got to play it once or twice at least. So you can see the end game and you can see how much you can affect <laughs> how the end game is going to end. But it's very cool, very different game. If you're looking for something different, definitely check that out. Uh, Captain Sonar is an excellent game. Haven't reviewed that one. Don't have it. Uh, friends got this. We've played it a few times and it's great. It's a very different kind of team versus team game with these like uh, transparencies. I would say go watch the uh, Shut Up and Sit Down review. I think they did a review of it. I remember watching it and that's a good review and I would certainly get this. I think it's constantly going out of, out of print and they keep selling through it. So definitely pick that up. Uh, next one is Scythe. And that is been, you know, probably maybe more hype than Mechs versus Minions. A very excellent uh, dudes on a map style Euro game uh, where you have got some combat and some economics and some cool kind of like a rondel type of mechanics for your player board. Very good, solid uh, game. And I think everybody should look at dovetailing off of that Cry Havoc. Excellent game. Uh, very interesting take on card combat where you're playing cards for different sort of types of combat and the way that, uh, you know, you move troops around and the objectives and things that you try to go after, a very interesting, uh, different design. Uh, next one is Mansions of Madness, a second edition. And I'll just kind of go into the next one is Descent with the app because the, both of these are kind of app games. I've since moved on from both of these because uh, I'm really waiting for the Imperial Assault app to come out. Uh, so 
yeah, I like these apps. I like the apps that have been used in these games. I like how they kind of drive the story. They drive some of the randomization. Just a lot to explore. I hope people keep exploring this and keep kind of pushing the envelope in terms of what's possible. And, you know, the ergonomics of the app in the table and all that and interacting with the other players. I think there's tons to explore here. Uh, next two, I'll just put these, the others in Doom, both uh, one versus many games and similar to Imperial Assault or Descent. Uh, but these are ones that you don't necessarily have to play a campaign through. You can just say, hey, I'm going to be the Overlord this time, you be the Overlord next time. Uh, the others in Doom are both, both very kind of like balls to the wall, uh, aggressive, fast paced, you know, boom, 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 I'm doing this, I'm doing that. It's kind of very configurable uh, and all that kind of stuff. So it's really fun, competitive, head to head, one versus many style games and really kind of uh, best in class, I think, of these uh, particular type of genre, these two. Very, very fun. Uh, next one is Arkham Horror, the LCG. I'm still kind of partial to the Warhammer Quest adventure game because of the whole delve mode and everything, but this is really good. It's making a lot of buzz, and you can kind of play a role-playing game, card game after a while if, with many of the expansions. Uh, next one is Imhotep. Uh, came out earlier this year. I think it was nominated for Spiel des Arts. That's a really cool, solid Euro game. you got to take a look at it. And last couple here, Millennium Blades, amazing, different, off the wall, crazy, awkward, but good design of sort of like simulating being in a game store playing trading card games and going up through tournaments and you kind of play a mini trading card game inside the game. <laughs> uh, Dead of Winter, Long Night. I don't usually put expansions on here, but Dead of Winter, Long Night really kicks up the narrative, launches it into like the next stratosphere makes it a little bit more adult in some ways, adds in some crazy kind of mutant effects and all that. Really adds a kind of a fix to the basic structure of the game with the way the turn order goes. Um, excellent game. And then last one is Hands in the Sea, which is sort of like a few acres of snow, but set during the time of Rome versus Carthage, and really is a refinement of that entire system. Okay, so I blew through those. I just, I really wanted to mention all those. I apologize, kind of just blowing through them, but Definitely look at all these games. I think I've reviewed most of these. And um, so now we're going to talk about a contest. So first of all, uh, way to enter the contest. Um, yeah. If you comment on this video, then you're entered. And the Patreon supporters already know this, but if you voted on the poll, then you're already entered. And people are going to ask, what's the poll? Well, let me get through the games I'm giving away. I'm giving away four. First one is Great Western Trail. Stronghold Games is kind enough to send me a copy. And I will send this to somebody that randomly wins. So that will be one person will get that. Now, Patreon supporters voted on, I picked a list of like 10 games from previous years of some of my top games. And there were kind of two that were voted on and were really close. So the second place was Imperial Assault. And I was very happy, <laughs> very dear to my heart, that everybody, the winner was Kalis. Uh, so I will be giving away a copy of Kalis. I will get some from Cool Stuff or something and send that to somebody. And so that will, one winner will get a copy of Kalis. I hope everybody's excited about that. I know the game's kind of old. Uh, then I will have two other games, and these have been sent to me um, by different folks here. Now, Pegasus Spiel sent me a copy of uh, Oracle uh, Delphi. And Tasty Mitchell already sent me a copy. So I said, you know what, let me give this away. And so I'm going to send you this. This is the copy here. It's still in shrink. So I'm going to send somebody this. Now you still have the English rules and everything. It's the same game. Uh, so somebody will win a copy of Oracle of Delphi. And then Tasty Mitchell, who has been a sponsor for me this year going forward, is going to send me a copy of Ponzi Scheme. So there we go. So somebody's going to win Great Western Trail. Somebody's going to win Kalis. Somebody's going to win Oracle of Delphi. And somebody's going to win Ponzi Scheme. Again, leave a comment. Unless you were a Patreon person and you voted, then you're already in there. You don't have to leave a comment. Okay, so that is the top 10 list. I hope everybody had a fun year. I will uh, try to have fun next year <laughs> and uh, keep doing this for the next year. And uh, I appreciate everybody watching and uh, thumbing the, the like button, all that good stuff. And uh, please, everybody, take care of yourselves and have a safe uh, holiday and a happy new year and all that kind of good stuff. And thank you very much. Take care.